joining us today. We'd like to take this moment to welcome you to Cal's webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be getting started at 4 p.m. sharp. We thank you for being on time. Once again, if you are just joining us, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be starting at 4 p.m. as we let people file into the webinar. Oh, I see so there are some people from DC and Northern Virginia. Thank you so much from Switzerland. That's awesome, welcome. Thank you for joining us, New York. Yay. <laughs> wow, that's excellent. Seattle, Indiana, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm so sorry, I might have missed some, but thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We have very short time. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Althea Rowe, Communications Coordinator at the Center for Applied Linguistics. Thank you for joining us today for this 30 minute webinar in our Critical Conversations Research to Policy and Practice ser series. This year, our theme is Multilingualism Without Borders. We're examining spaces where multilingualism is practiced across, through, and around all kinds of borders and barriers. Today's webinar is Critical by Literacies Without Borders, Translanguaging, and Culturally Sustaining Approaches. We are recording this webinar and we'll post the recording on cal.org after this event. Before we begin, please mute your microphones to avoid interruptions. You can activate closed captioning by pressing the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. The Center for Applied Linguistics is providing this event as a public service. However, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed belong solely to the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of Center for Applied Linguistics. Our panel com comprises esteemed experts who work at the intersection of research policy and practice in language education, language access, and equity. You can learn more about our guest speakers on the ca webinars cal.org webpage, where you can also find resources that may reference during the, today's call. After the call, we'll update the page with a recording of the call and we'll email the link to our attendees. We encourage you to ask questions during the call, specifically only the questions in the Q&A box will be answered. Um, but we'll answer as many as possible at the end of our discussion. It's an excellent opportunity to tap into the incredible wealth of knowledge we are fortunate enough to have on today's call. Also, please click the chat button at the bottom of your screen anytime to share your thoughts and comments. Try it out today by letting us know where you're listening from today. Well, I will now pass the microphone to today's webinar facilitators. Thank you, Althea. My name is Maribel Marrero Colon and I'm the Assistant Director of Professional Development at the Center for Applied Linguistics. I am extremely happy to be here today and to be you know, a participant to this wonderful talk. So I'm going to pass the, uh, the mic, so to speak, to Dr. Kathy Escamilla, who will be asking the questions today. Hello. And I'll be coming back later on. Thank you, Maribel, and um, good day to everyone from wherever you are, whether it's day or night or still morning. Uh, my name is Kathy Escamilla, and I am a professor emeritus from the University of Colorado at Boulder um, from the School of Education. And today we have with us Dr. Nancy Hornberger, who is a professor emerita of education at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Catherine Mortimer, who is an associate professor of bilingual biliteracy education at the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, they are going to share their research and perspectives with us as we discuss today's topic. And we have a short 30 minutes to get into this very interesting topic. So let's begin. I'm going to start with the first question and then turn it over to Dr. Hornberger and Dr. Uh, Mortimer. Um, so the first question is what what uh, borders or barriers currently exist for multilingual learners in the schools? Well, thank you so much for this chance to be together and to share this work. Um, one barrier uh, for, for multilingual students um, that we're focusing on is 
um, board barriers for borderland students in computer science. Latinos and Latinas are underrepresented in computer science, science careers and courses, both in college and high school. And for example, Latinas make up just 2% of our current tech workforce. Emergent bilingual students are underrepresented as well in computer science courses in middle and high school, sometimes because these courses are only taught in English and sometimes because they're required to exit English learner classification before accessing computer science or, or other non-core offerings. Um, these underrepresentations are a problem because these groups of students miss out on exciting, interesting, and high paying careers. Also because without these students' perspectives, many important problems and solutions don't get seen and addressed with computing. So at the University of Texas at El Paso or UTEP and the El Paso Independent School District, we live in a, and we live and work in a US-Mexico borderland community where many of our students are among these underrepresented groups in computer science. And our collaboration uh, aims to break down some of these barriers to computer science in part through the development of a bilingual borderland-based video game called Soli Agua and um, bilingual culturally sustaining lesson units that use the game. A screenshot of the Soli Agua game uh, is shown here. So the objective of the Soli Agua project is to increase participation of Latinx students, girls, and emergent bilingual students in computer science by crossing multiple borders. Um, our team includes teachers and administrators uh, at the El Paso Independent School District, as well as faculty and students at UTEP. And we co-designed lesson units together for teaching computational thinking at two predominantly Latinx middle schools using translanguaging and culturally sustaining uh, we did this in an effort to draw on borderland students' biliteracies, for example, their knowledge of English and Spanish and of our borderland region and the Chihuahuan Desert where we live. In this work, we aim to cross a number of different kinds of borders, linguistic borders, national borders, content borders, disciplinary borders, and also institutional borders through our partnership work. So when the... Uh... Research to policy organizers first posed the question about borders and barriers. And I immediately thought of Catherine's project in Juarez and El Paso. And, and soon after that, I thought of um, Fred Erickson's discussion some years ago about borders often being politicized while boundaries are not. In other words, cultural linguistic difference is not in and itself the issue, but rather the way it's treated. And this is something that Seems like it should go without saying, and yet it needs to be said over and over and over again. And it, this, that, that insight also underlies the continuum of biliteracy, which is a framework uh, that I developed in the 1980s while engaged in a long-term ethnographic project with multilingual learners and teachers in two Philadelphia public schools and their communities. And this the framework has been taken up and both then and since by students and colleagues around the world. In this framework, I define biliteracy, as you can see on the slide, as any and all instances of communication in two or more languages in or around writing. So I just want to draw your attention to it's a very broad definition. It emphasizes interaction around writing and two or more languages. Um, the continua, the idea of the continua, was, is, is intended to uh, recognize that things that we often talk about as separate are actually continuous and dynamic in interaction. So the COBE framework, the continuum of biliteracy framework, encompasses the full range of contexts, such as classrooms, communities, policy, and beyond, the, the full range of media, including languages and literacies, but also digital media and beyond, and content, including subjects, experiences, identities, meanings, and so forth. And all of that in and through which biliteracy development occurs. For example, in this um, little graphic here of the development of biliteracy, we see how listening and speaking, um, oral and written or reading and writing, and first and second language are not separate, but actually continuous skills. 
So um, this tool, the continuum of biliteracy, we see it as a tool for seeing and transcending barriers. It's a tool for teachers and policymakers to create and monitor classrooms that maximize learners' opportunities to develop the full range of their languages and literacy. And it offers an analytical potential to focus on specific aspects or dimensions without losing sight of the, of the total, of the whole thing um, that impact these opportunities. So it helps us see opportunities for biliteracies that we might not otherwise have seen. And we hope to demonstrate that for you a little bit today. So it's a tool for seeing and transcending barriers. Thank you so much. Um, the next question asks, what are some key insights from your research? So one of the key insights um, surfaced during our work to select culturally sustaining and translanguaging strategies for the lesson units that we were developing. And in this process, we discussed what we knew about the students at these two schools, their interests, their lives, experiences, their funds of knowledge, uh, their biliteracies, uh, things that we could have them draw on for learning computational thinking and content. And in this Jamboard activity and many other moments, the idea surfaced that students' lives on the border in El Paso and Juarez, and particularly crossing between them, were a place where students already did a lot of the math and did a lot of math and computational thinking. So while the U.S.-Mexico border is often perceived as primar primarily in terms of national security and the border walls, that is something that is solid. It's actually something in that our pe that people in our community cross on a very regular basis daily, weekly, monthly, from El Paso to Juarez and Juarez to El Paso, as part of everyday life, doing everyday things, to buy a birthday cake, to see a doctor, to see family, to attend school, to go to work, to go to swim team practice. So in this sense, we don't just live on one side of, or the other of the border, but on both. And we do, we're not necessarily two separate communities, but in many ways, like a single, more like a single whole. As one of my former students said in the borderland, I can see my home in Juarez from my home in El Paso. In this video from our planning work, uh, we talked about helping students recognize places in their daily lives where they're already using math from the classroom. Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Medrano, both math teachers, then talked about a place in their students' lives where, they're all, where the students are already using the math from the classroom. Uh, this was, this uh, place was in their experiences crossing the international bridge. Something just hit me. So we're talking about these kids coming from Juarez, right? I mean, there's a linear equation itself. I mean, you they have to cross the bridge. They walk and they pay. They take the ruta, right? They have to eat lunch. On their way back, they have to pay again. And they, have, they pay a different amount coming from Juarez and then going to Juarez. So those are different and then they have to also include their their bus fare, um, so I mean, yeah, right. They use math every day. Yeah, I mean, and converting just, like you you're converting pesos to dollars or dollars to pesos too. So, right, Dude, like you can come up with like a great problem for that one. Is like you have you have fifty pesos and you want to go to you want to go to Japan, right? Something like that. Like how how many days would that cover you for the whole yeah. month? I mean, something like that. Yeah. So in the course of the next year and a half of planning, this idea surfaced a number of times. The idea that we could use students' border crossing experiences as a context for doing math and computational thinking. When we piloted the lesson units in classrooms, they, these pilots included many rich and creative uses of computational thinking together with math, English, social studies, and translanguaging to do this work. In math in particular, though, we found it especially difficult to keep students' biliteracies very central and explicit in the work that we were doing. Um, in seventh grade math, for example, an important context for practicing math is problems released from the state standardized test. In one classroom, Mr. Vasquez used these problems on the screen to engage students in inquiry-based exploration of two-step equations. He used oral translanguaging strategies such as identifying key vocabulary words in both languages, giving instructions in both languages, and students, and also asking the students to work in small group discussion in both languages. But of course, the, te the test questions were written for the whole state of Texas, and they use contexts like 
Walter and Brian's CD collection or Mary and Brianna's book collection to do the math of two-step equations. And so looking together at the video recordings of the lessons and thinking about how to revise the unit plans, we wondered how could we make students border crossing biliteracies more explicit, even in doing state standardized test questions? How could we recenter students' knowledge while still adhering closely to the tight pacing of seventh grade math in preparation for the high stakes test in the spring? And this is actually the kind of question that the continuum of biliteracy framework was developed to help answer. It helps us to see uh, the tendency toward the traditionally more powerful ends of the continua, which are circled here. And specifically in this case, toward written English and standardized contexts for math. And it helps us to see how, how to some ways to possibly rebalance and bring students language and cultural resources or their biliteracies back towards the center. So we talked about what our team could do to support that. Uh, in terms of the continua, we saw that we could rebalance the lessons by paying attention to and using Spanish in written form and border crossing by literacies as contexts for, for math. One support we identified was for us to rewrite the test questions and produce materials that took border crossing by literacies as the context for math, but the teachers didn't need to create themselves. So for example, we rewrote the first question from the previous slide changing the collection of CDs to Pokemon cards and writing the problem in Spanish. And using the graphics, the graphics from the Soliawa game, which are all things from the Chihuahuan Desert, we made slides that teachers could easily reproduce and adapt. We also wrote a problem using border crossing as a context for doing two-step equations using both Spanish and English. This new problem read, according to Google Maps from the Paso del Norte or Sixth Avenue bridge to the middle school, it's a distance of 2.1 kilometers. How much time would it take Jose to walk to the school at a speed of four kilometers per hour? This, the problem draws on border crossing and the calculations that students do in that everyday experience, as well as Spanish and translanguaging as resources for doing two-step equations. These can seem like simple changes, but the revision of these problems requ actually required our sustained attention to notice the opportunity and, and some time to think about how to recenter students, the students' border crossing by literacies, uh, as well as to create new materials. This is time that can be hard for individual teachers to find, but it was possible within the resources of our team. So our third insight then uh, that we wanted to offer today is that the continuum of by literacy can be a tool for this for this activity of trying to keep students' biliteracy central over time. It helps us keep moving the curriculum toward the less traditionally powerful ends of the continua. So if we look now closely, more closely at these continua and the power relations across them, we can use the continua to highlight and rebalance students' biliteracy. So for example, in context, the, the look, specifically looking at the multilingual monolingual continuum, we can think about curriculum that's located in the multilingual realities of everyday life and not just in standardized monolingual tests. Or in terms of the development of biliteracy along the oral written and the L1, L2 continua, we can consider translanguaging not just as an oral communication tool or a support for oral communication, but in written problem solving and academic learning. And in terms of the content of biliteracy, we in terms and looking specifically at the contextualized, decontextualized continuum, we can think about doing math in a contextualized way. In this case, the context of boarding crossing, border crossing in their everyday lives. And finally, the media of biliteracy involve not only translanguaging itself as a simultaneous exposure but also math and computation and translanguaging all as media um, that are simultaneously at play here, including also visual and digital media as well as language and written language. So um, this we hope can demonstrate um, a key insight number three. That takes us to question three. 
Here's question three. I wish we had so much more time to talk about this, but the third <laughs> question asks, uh, what are key policy changes um, that we should be aspiring to as a result of the work that you're doing? So we tried to summarize here both the insights that we, you know, we're trying, we're giving some details on and a few policy recommendations that come out of it. And hopefully maybe there will be time for a little Q&A around it. But in any case, the key insights that students' knowledge of border crossing was a rich context for doing math, English, social studies, and computer science, and that keeping students' border crossing biliteracies at the center required really sustained attention over time and support from the, the, the project team. It wasn't enough to sort of have the teachers got a brainstorm, and but to actually implement it in the class takes, you know, there's many demands on teachers' time. And finally, the continuum of biliteracy can serve as a tool for keeping those biliteracies central over time and throughout the whole planning practice and planning cycles. So out of this, we, we thought that we would like to recommend policy at both at, at you know, higher levels as well as you know, teachers as policymakers. So the three that we could articulate here um, are that in policy and assessment, we would like to see, of course, we would like to see standardized tests use a wider variety of biliteracies as contexts for doing content. So a word to the policymakers, please take note. Um, in terms of districts and campuses, we urge leaders and educators to both um, ensure that bilingual students have access to code switching, to computer science, sorry, even before exiting their English learner status. And second, to give teachers time, for example, in uh, professional leadership, to work in collaboration to creatively adapt standardized materials and, and so that these materials draw on students by literacies and it's best done together. And finally, we encourage teachers to, to see and take up opportunities on your own or even with a single colleague to make small but meaningful changes that recenter your students' biliteracies in otherwise standardized curricula. And we just wanted to conclude by recognizing the whole Soli Agua team of teachers, administrators, undergraduate students and graduate students and faculty involved in the project who are listed here by name. And we wanted to invite you to check out the Soli Agua game. You can use the QR code here on the screen or the, there'll be a link put, put in the chat as well. So thank you for this opportunity to share this work and look forward to your questions. Well, hi, we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, there's a request for Nancy to start this off. Uh, it says, are there instances where some policies around the world are implementing the continual biliteracy framework as a tool of sustainable multilingualism and sustainable development? <laughs> are there instances where they're not using it? Where they are being used. Oh, where they are. Oh, okay. That's, um, yes. Um, in fact, maybe this is an appropriate moment for me to refer you to a recent paper that's available free to download, a, a paper of mine, where I try to bring together some of those examples of how it's being used around the world. Um, there, one of the contexts where earliest use that I'm aware of was made is um, South Africa. And we I've written some about that. And the project for alternative education in South Africa really grabbed hold of the continua early on and, and tried to, you know, design um, classroom practices and curriculum and materials in a newly trilingual school that was a result of the end of apartheid. Um, and there's other examples like that. I don't want to belabor the point too much, but there's also several contexts in Europe right now where um, Luxembourg is one that I'm thinking of. It's, it tends to be that researchers um, are in touch with me and we together, you know, like a policy emerges in, um, in the country and then the researcher tries to put together a project that will, you know, bring the continua to this policy context. That happened in Luxembourg. Another one 
that um, is an interesting case. Now that it, it's just slipped out of my head again, sorry. But there are other cases. Um, I'll refer you to that article. I'm sure you'll, there will be a chat link or the, after the seminar, you'll get a link to the article. Thank you. Oh, we have another question um, ca uh, asking Catherine on this one. Did any of the teachers that you worked with struggle with concurrent translation versus using translanguaging as a dynamic experience in the classroom? So, you know, um, it's, it's that debate back and forth of translation versus translanguaging. And if so, how did they navigate it? I would say that a struggle that came up in within the group was um, translanguaging was very natural for um, most members of the group used in daily and life experience. Um, and teachers were, were all very used to using it as a tool um, in the classroom, although um, mostly in implicit ways. And so um, something that we talked about within the team was how to make translanguaging um, strategies more explicit, to uh, invite students to do particular things in, in both languages or one language or the other, specifically as opposed to the sort of natural flow of um, language use um, in our borderland community, which is absolutely appropriate, but it can be enriched by a more uh, explicit attention to let's 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 remember, uh, for example, remember in your small groups, feel free to use your full linguistic repertoire, things like that, and um, making those translanguaging strategies more explicit was was something that um, we talked about the difficulty of doing that when it is so natural, um, and and so that was something that came up in the group as as a challenge. Um, there was a request, if you guys could please define translanguaging and translanguage and if it dif and how it differs from, because you guys used the word code switching before, how it differs from code switching. In a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easy question there. <laughs> Who wants to tackle it? Uh Please go ahead. We might have <laughs> we might might have a collaborative a collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. We got a couple Please. of minutes that you can really go into that thief. <laughs> okay. So, Kathy, do you want to say something? No. no. Um, well, there are books now about this. Uh, Jeff McSwan has recently co-edited a, a, a whole volume. Um, there's and there's also a lot of difference of opinion among researchers. I usually go back to Ophelia Garcia's work on translanguaging, which for her um, was really a response to her decades of work, work with Puerto Rican communities and Latinos in general in the US, um, who, whose communicative practices in the community are very much fluid and um, use a lot of code switching. Code switching for me is the more, um, I guess, linguistic defined form of translanguaging. The two terms for me are complementary. They don't have to be at war with each other. Um, they're different, just different research traditions that came up um, to analyze these phenomena. Um, translanguage, there are others who make, a, make more of a thing about the difference between them. But uh, for me, it's, it's more important to emphasize that basically it's a fluid movement from um, across what are recognized in the world as language languages like Spanish and English, but for the speakers uh, tend to be more of a, of, of a one resource, one communicative resource or one set of communicative resources that they are that are available for them to draw on. Um, that's a start. I, there's much more one could say, but maybe I should turn over to the to the others. Yeah, I, I think that's a um, ex expansive version of what I usually use. I usually use a a, um, a full use of one's full linguistic repertoire to meet one's communicative needs, in, in, you know, across various social contexts. So in the case of a classroom, but, you know, different kinds of activities that we do, having access to my, as a student, my full linguistic repertoire to do the task, a math task, 
or a language specific task or a, a social studies task. Um, that's generally the, the, the definition that, that I've been working with. Yeah. Well, unfortunately we've run out of time. So we are, <laughs> we are going to, um, we are going to be, you know, logging the questions that are on here and hopefully uh, be able to add some more to this. So this pretty much concludes uh, our discussion. Unfortunately, it's not enough time. It's a great topic, not enough time. And we thank, you know, our wonderful guest speakers and our, you know, and our other uh, moderator. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, your expertise. Thank you to our audience from all over the world who has joined us both U.S. and out of the U.S. Um, for your great questions, comments, the connections, your enthusiasm around this really important issue. So we will be emailing you a recording of the webinar. We uh, please share what you've learned today with your colleagues, invite them to join our next webinar, um, open up discussions amongst yourselves, and please visit uh, cal.org for more resources to help you in your support of multilingual learners. Uh, we are gonna ask you to please take a moment and complete a brief survey about today's webinar. We really would appreciate that because it helps us in the future uh, plan more webinars around the areas that you are interested in. So thank you so much. And Nick, Althea, any last uh, words? Sorry, um, no, uh, just thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again at next month's webinar, but please check your emails as you will be receiving a follow-up email with a full recording and a survey question. Thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank Bye everyone. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.